The Compart One by Aristotle. Audiobook 13x44. Moreover, a statement may be a unity in either of two ways, by conjunction, like the Iliad, or because it exhibits a single predicate as in hearing not accidentally in a single subject. That then is one way of defining definition. Another kind of definition is a formula exhibiting the cause of a thing's existence. Thus the former signifies without proving, but the latter will clearly be a quasi-demonstration of essential nature, differing from demonstration in the arrangement of its terms. For there is a difference between stating why it thunders, and stating what is the essential nature of thunder, since the first statement will be because fire is quenched in the clouds, while the statement of what the nature of thunder is will be the noise of fire being quenched in the clouds. Thus the same statement takes a different form. In one form it is continuous demonstration, in the other definition. Again, thunder can be defined as noise in the clouds, which is the conclusion of the demonstration embodying essential nature. On the other hand the definition of immediates is an indemonstrable positing of essential nature. We conclude then hat definition is, a, an indemonstrable statement of essential nature, or, b, a syllogism of essential nature differing from demonstration in grammatical form, or, c, the conclusion of a demonstration giving essential nature. Our discussion has therefore made plain, 1, in what sense and of what things the essential nature is demonstrable, and in what sense and of what things it is not, 2, what are the various meanings of the term definition, and in what sense and of what things it proves the essential nature, and in what sense and of what things it does not, 3, what is the relation of definition to demonstration, and how far the same thing is both definable and demonstrable and how far it is not. We think we have scientific knowledge when we know the cause, and there are four causes. 1, the definable form, 2, an antecedent which necessitates a consequent, 3, the efficient cause, 4, the final cause. Hence each of these can be the middle term of a proof, 4, a, though the inference from antecedent to necessary consequent does not hold if only one premise is assumed 2 is the minimum still when there are two it holds on condition that they have a single common middle term. So it is from the assumption of this single middle term that the conclusion follows necessarily. The following example will also show this. Why is the angle in a semicircle a right angle? or from what assumption does it follow that it is a right angle? Thus, let A be right angle, B the half of two right angles, C the angle in a semicircle. Then B is the cause in virtue of which A, right angle, is attributable to C, the angle in a semicircle, since B equals A and the other, viz. C equals B, for C is half of two right angles. Therefore it is the assumption of B, the half of two right angles, from which it follows that A is attributable to C, i.e. that the angle in a semicircle is a right angle. Moreover, B is identical with, B, the define form of A, since it is what A's definition signifies. Moreover, the formal cause has already been shown to be the middle. C. Why did the Athenians become involved in the Persian War, means what cause originated the waging of war against the Athenians, and the answer is, because they raided Sardis with the Eritreans, since this originated the war. Let A be war, B unprovoked raiding, C the Athenians. Then B, unprovoked raiding, is true of C the Athenians and A is true of B, since men make war on the unjust aggressor. So A, having war waged upon them, is true of B, the initial aggressors, and B is true of C, the Athenians, who were the aggressors. Hence here too the cause in these case the efficient cause is the middle term. D, this is no less true where the cause is the final cause. E.g. Widows one take a walk after supper. For the sake of one's health. Why does a house exist? for the preservation of one's goods. 
The end in view is in the one case health, in the other preservation. To ask the reason why one must walk after supper is precisely to ask to what end one must do it. Let C be walking after supper, B the non-regurgitation of a health. Then let walking after supper possess the property of preventing food from rising to the orifice of the stomach, and let this condition be healthy, since it seems that B, the non-regurgitation of food, is attributable to C, taking a walk, and that A, health, is attributable to B. What, then, is the cause through which A, the final cause, inheres in C? It is B, the non-regurgitation of wood, but bis a kind of definition of A, for A will be explained by it. Why is B the cause of A's belonging to C? Because to be in a condition such as B is to be in health. The definitions must be transposed, and then the detail will become clearer. Incidentally, here the order of coming to be is the reverse of what it is in proof through the efficient cause. In the efficient order the middle term must come to be first, whereas in the teleological order the minor, C, must first take place, and the end in view comes last in time. The same thing may exist for an end and be necessitated as well. For example, light shines through a lantern, 1, because that which consists of relatively small particles necessarily passes through pores larger than those particles assuming that light does issue by penetration and, 2, for an end, namely to save us from stumbling. If then, a thing can exist through two causes, can it come to be through two causes as for instance if thunder be a hiss and a roar necessarily produced by the quenching of fire, and also designed, as the Pythagoreans say, for a threat to terrify those that lie in Tartarus? Indeed, there are very many such cases, mostly among the processes and products of natural world, for nature, in different senses of the term nature, produces now for an end, now by necessity. Necessity too is of two kinds. It may work in accordance with a thing's natural tendency, or by constraint and in opposition to it, as, for instance, by necessity a stone is borne both upwards and downwards, but not by the same necessity. Of the products of man's intelligence some are never due to chance or necessity but always to an end, as for example a house or a statue, others, such as health or safety, may result from chance as well. Itis mostly in cases where the issue is indeterminate, though only where the production does not originate in chance, and the end is consequently good, that a result is due to an end, and this is true alike in nature or in art. By chance, on the other hand, nothing comes to be for an end. The effect may be still coming to be, or its occurrence may be past or future, yet cause will be the same as when it is actually existent for it is the middle which is the cause except that if the effect actually exists the cause is actually existent, if it is coming to be so is the cause, if its occurrence is past the cause is past, if you tour the cause is future. For example, the moon was eclipsed because the earth intervened, is becoming eclipsed because the earth is in process of intervening, will be eclipsed because the earth will intervene, is eclipsed because the earth intervenes. To take a second example. Assuming that the definition of ice is solidified water, let C be water, A solidified, B the middle, which is the cause, namely total failure of heat. Then B is attributed to C, and A, solidification, to B. Ice when B is occurring, has formed when B has occurred, and will form when B shall occur. This sort of cause, then, and its effect come to be simultaneously when they are in process of becoming, and exist simultaneously when they actually exist, and the same holds good when they are past and when they are future. But what of cases where they are not simultaneous? Can causes and effects different from one another form, as they seem to us to form, a continuous succession, a past effect resulting from a past cause different from itself, a future effect from a future cause different from it, and an effect which is coming to be from a cause different from and prior to it? 
Now on this theory it is from the posterior event that we reason, and this though these later events actually have their source of origin in previous events. A fact which shows that also when the effect is coming to be we still reason from the posterior event, and from the event we cannot reason, we cannot argue that because an event A has occurred, therefore an event B has occurred subsequently to A but still in the past and the same holds good if the occurrence is future, cannot reason because, be the time interval definite or indefinite, it will never be possible to infer that because it is true to say that A occurred, therefore it is true to say that B, the subsequent event, occurred, for in the interval between T events, though A has already occurred, the latter statement will be false. And the same argument applies also to future events, i.e. One cannot infer from an event which occurred in the past that a future event will occur. The reason of this is that the middle must be homogeneous, past when the extremes are past, future when they are future, coming to be when they are coming to be, actually existent when they are actually existent, and there cannot be a middle term homogeneous with extremes respectively past and future. And it is a further difficulty in this theory that the time interval can be neither indefinite nor definite, since during it the inference will be false. We have also to inquire what it is that holds events together so that the coming to be now occurring in actual things follows upon a past event. It is evident, we may suggest, that a past event and a present process cannot be contiguous, for not even two past events can be contiguous. For past events are limits and atomic, so just as points are not contiguous neither are past events, since both are indivisible. For the same reason a past event and a present process cannot be contiguous, for the process is divisible, the event indivisible. Thus the relation of present process to paste vent is analogous to that of line to point, since a process contains an infinity of past events. These questions, however, must receive a more explicit treatment in our general theory of Kange. The following must suffice as an account of the manner in which the middle would be identical with the cause on the supposition that coming tobe is a series of consecutive events. For in the terms of such a series two the middle and major terms must form an immediate premise, e.g. We argue that, since C has occurred, therefore A occurred. And C's occurrence was posterior, A's prior, but C is the source of the inference because it is nearer to the present moment, and the starting point of time is the present. We next argue that, since D has occurred, therefore C occurred. Then we conclude that, since D has occurred, therefore A must have occurred, and the cause is C, for since D has occurred C must have occurred, and since C has occurred A must previously have occurred. If we get our middle term in this way, will the series terminate in an immediate premise, or since, as we said, no two events are contiguous, will a fresh middle term always intervene because there is an infinity of middles? No. Though no two events are contiguous, yet we must start from a premise consisting of a middle and the present event as major. The like is true of future events too, since if it is true to say that D will exist, it must be a prior truth to say that A will exist, and the cause of this conclusion is C, for if D will exist, C will exist prior to D, and if C will exist, A will exist prior to it. And here too the same infinite divisibility might be urged, since future events are not contiguous. But here too an immediate basic premise must be assumed. And in the world of fact this is so. If a house has been built, then blocks must have been quarried and shaped. The reason is that a house having been built necessitates a foundation having been laid, and if a foundation has been laid blocks must have been shaped beforehand. Again. If a house will be built, blocks will similarly be shaped beforehand, and proof is through the middle in the same way, for the foundation will exist before the house. Now we observe in nature a certain kind of circular process of coming tobe, and this is possible only if the middle and extreme terms are reciprocal, since conversion is conditioned by reciprocity in the terms of the proof. 
This the convertibility of conclusions and premises has been proved in our early chapters, and the circular process is an instance of this. In actual fact it is exemplified thus. When the earth had been moistened an exhalation was bound to rise, and when an exhalation had risen cloud was bound to form, and from the formation of cloud rain necessarily resulted and by the fall of rain the earth was necessarily moistened. But this was the starting point, so that a circle is completed, for posit any one of the terms and another follows from it, and from that another, and from the tagaint he first. Some occurrences are universal, for they are, or come to be what they are, always and in every case, others again are not always what they are but only as a general rule. For instance, not every man can grow a beard, but it is the general rule. In the case of such connections the middle term too must be a general rule. For if A is predicated universally of B and B of C, add to must be predicated always and in every instance of C, since to hold in every instance and always is of the nature of the universal. But we have assumed a connection which is a general rule, consequently the middle term B must also be a general rule. So connections which embody a general rule I.E which exist or come to be as a general rule will also derive from immediate basic premises. We have already explained how essential nature is set out in the terms of a demonstration, and the sense in which it is or is not demonstrable or definable, so let us now discuss the method to be adopted in tracing the elements predicated as constituting the definable form. Now of the attributes which inhere always in each several thing there are some which are wider in extent than it but not wider than its genus, by attributes of wider extent mean all such as are universal attributes of each several subject, but in their application are not confined to that subject. While an attribute may inhere in either a triad, yet also in a subject not a triad as being inheres in triad but also in subjects not numbers at all odd on the other hand is an attribute inhering in a very triad and of wider application, inhering as it does also in pentad, but which does not extend beyond the genus of triad, for pentad is a number, but nothing outside number is odd. It is such attributes which we have to select up to the exact point at which they are severally of wider extent than the subject but collectively coextensive with it, for this synthesis must be the substance of the thing. For example every triad possesses the attributes number, odd, and prime in both senses, i.e. not only as possessing no divisors, but also as not being a sum of numbers. This, then, is precisely what triad is, viz. A number, odd, and prime in the former and also the latter sense off term. For these attributes taken severally apply, the first two to all odd numbers, the last to the dyad also as well as to the triad, but, taken collectively, to no other subject. Now since we have shown above that attributes predicated as belonging to the essential nature are necessary and that universals are necessary, and since the attributes which we select as inhering in triad, or in any other subject whose attributes we select in this way, are predicated as belonging to its essential nature, triad will thus possess these attributes necessarily. Further, that the synthesis of them constitutes the substance of triad is shown by the following argument. If it is not identical with the being of triad, it must be related to triad as a genus named or nameless. It will then be of wider extent than triad assuming that wider potential extent is the character of a genus. If on the other hand this synthesis is applicable to no subject other than individual triads, it will be identical with the being Goff triad, because we make the further assumption that the substance of each subject is the predication of elements in its essential nature down to the last differentia characterizing the individuals. It follows that any other synthesis thus exhibited will likewise be identical with the being Goffed subject. The author of a handbook on a subject that is a generic whole should divide the genus into its first infamy species number e.g. into triad and diadan then endeavor to seize their definitions by the method we have described the definition, for example, of straight line or circle or right angle. After that, 
having established what the category is to which the subaltern genus belongs quantity or quality, for instance he, he should examine the properties peculiar to the species, working through the proximate common differentia. He should proceed thus because the attributes of the genera compounded of the infamy species will be clearly given be the definitions of the species, since the basic element of them all is the definition, i.e. the simple infirma species, and the attributes inhere essentially in the simple infamy species, in the genera only in virtue oft he's. Divisions according to differentia are a useful accessory to this method. What force they have as proofs we did, indeed, explain above, but that merely towards collecting the essential nature they may be of use we will proceed to show. They might, indeed, seem to be of no use at all, but rather to assume everything get the start and to be no better than an initial assumption made without division. But, in fact, the order in which the attributes are predicated does make a difference it matters whether we say animal tame biped, or biped animaltum. For if every definable thing consists of two elements and animal tame forms a unity, and again out of these and the further differentia man, or whatever else is the unity under construction, is constituted, then the elements we assume have necessarily been reached by division. Again, division is the only possible method of avoiding the omission of any element of the essential nature. Thus, if the primary genus is assumed and we then take one of the lower divisions, the dividendum will not fall whole into this division. E.g. It is not all animal which is either whole-winged or split-winged but all winged animal, for it is winged animal to which this differentiation belongs. The primary differentiation of animal is that within which all animal falls. The like is true of fever yother genus, whether outside animal or a subaltern genus of animal, e.g. The primary differentiation of bird is that within which falls every bird, offish that with hind which falls every fish. So, if we proceed in this way, we can be sure that nothing has been omitted. By any other method one is bound to omit something without knowing it. To define and divide one need not know the whole of existence. Yet some hold it impossible to know the differentia distinguishing each thing from every single other thing without knowing every single other thing, and one cannot, they say, know each thing without knowing its differentia, since everything is identical with that from which it does not differ, and other than that from which it differs. Now first of all this is a fallacy. Not every differentia precludes identity, since many differentia inhere in things specifically identical, though not in the substance of these nor essentially. Secondly, when one has taken one's differing pair of opposites and assumed that the two sides exhaust the genus, and that the subject one seeks to define is present in one or other of them, and one has further verified its presence in own often, then it does not matter whether or not one knows all the other subjects of which the differentia are also predicated. For it is obvious that when by this process one reaches subjects incapable of further differentiation one will possess the formula defining the substance. Moreover, to postulate that the division exhausts the genus is not illegitimate if the opposites exclude a middle, since if it is the differentia oft had genus, anything contained in the genus must lie on and of the two sides. In establishing God definition by division one should keep three objects in view. 1. The admission only of elements in the definable form, 2. The arrangement of these in the right order, 3. The omission of no such elements. The first is feasible because one can establish genus and differentia through the topic of genus, just as one can conclude the inherence of an accident through the topic of the accident. The right order will be achieved if the right term is assumed as primary and this will be ensured if the term selected is predicable of all the others but not all they of it, since there must be one such term. Having assumed this we at once proceed in the same way with the lower terms, for our second term will be the first of the remainder, our third the first of those which follow the second in a contiguous series, since when the higher term is excluded, that term of the remainder which is contiguous to it will be primary, and so on. 
our procedure makes it clear that no elements in the definable form have been omitted. We have taken the differentia that comes first in the order of division, pointing out that animal, e.g., is divisible exhaustively into A and B, and that the subject accepts one of the two as its predicate. Next we have taken the differentia oft whole thus reached, and shown that the whole we finally reach is not further divisible I.E. That as soon as we have taken the last differentia to form the concrete totality, this totality admits of no division into species. For it is clear that there is no superfluous addition, since all these terms we have selected are elements in the definable form, and nothing lacking, since any omission would have to be a genus or a differentia. Now the primary term is a genus, and this term taken in conjunction with its differentia is a genus. Moreover the differentia are all included, because there is now no further differentia, if there were, the final concrete would admit of division into species, which, we said, is not the case. To resume our account of the right method of investigation, we must start by observing a set of similar I.E. specifically identical individuals, and consider what element they have in common. We must then apply the same process to another set of individuals which belong to one species and are generically but not specifically identical with the former set. When we have established what the common element is in all members of this second species, and likewise in members of further species, we should again consider whether the results established possess any identity, and persevere until we reach a single formula, since this will be the definition of the thing. But if we reach not one formula but two or more, evidently the definiendum cannot be one thing but must be more than one. I may illustrate my meaning as follows. If we were inquiring what the essential nature of pride is, we should examine instances of proud mean we know of to see what, as such, they have in common, e.g. If Alcibiades was proud, or Achilles and Ajax were proud, we should find on inquiring what they all had in common, that it was intolerance of insult, it was this which drove Alcibiades to war, Achilles' wrath, and Ajax to suicide. We should next examine other cases, Lysander, for example, or Socrates, and then if these have in common indifference alike to good and ill fortune, I take these two results and inquire what common element have equanimity amid the vicissitudes of life and impatience of dishonor. If they have none, there will be two genera of pride. Besides, every definition is always universal and commensurate. The physician does not prescribe what is healthy for a single eye, but for all eyes or for a determinate species of eye. It is also easier by this method to define the single species than the universal, and that is why our procedure should be from th several species to the universal genera this for the further reason to that equivocation is less readily detected in genera than in infamy species. Indeed, perspicuity is essential in definitions, just as inferential movement is the minimum required in demonstrations, and we shall attain perspicuity if we can collect separately the definition of each species through the group of singulars which we have established e.g. The definition of similarity not unqualified but restricted to colors and to figures, the definition of acuteness, but only of sound and so proceed to the common universal with a careful avoidance of equivocation. We may add that if dialectical disputation must not employ metaphors, clearly metaphors and metaphorical expressions are precluded in definition. Otherwise dialectic would involve metaphors. In order to formulate the connections we wish to prove we have to select our analyses and divisions. The method of selection consists in laying down the common genus of all our subjects of investigation ifa.g. Theater animals, we lay down what the properties are which inhere in every animal. These established, we next lay down the properties essentially connected with the first of the remaining classes e.g. If this first subgenus is bird, the essential properties of every bird and so on, always characterizing the proximate subgenus. This will clearly at once enable us to say in virtue of what character the subgenera man, e.g. or horse possess their properties. 
Lita B animal, BTHE properties of fever animal, C to various species of animal. The neat is clear in virtue of what character B inheres in D namely A and that it inheres in C and E for the same reason. And throughout the remaining subgenera always the same rule applies. We are now talking gore examples from the traditional class names, but we must not confine ourselves to considering these. We must collect any other common character which we observe, and then consider with what species it is connected and what dot properties belong to it. For example, as the common properties of horned animals we collect the possession of a third stomach and only one row of teeth. Then since it is clear in virtue of what character they possess these attributes namely their horned character the next question is, to what species does the possession of horns attach? Yet a further method of selection is by analogy. For we cannot find a single identical name to give to a squid's pounce, a fish's spine, and an animal's bone, although these two possess common properties as if there were a single osseous nature. Some connections that require proof are identical in that they possess an identical middle e.g. A whole group might be proved through reciprocal replacement and of these one class are identical in genus, namely all those whose difference consists in their concerning different subjects or in their mode of manifestation. This latter class may be exemplified by the questions as to the causes respectively of echo, of reflection, and of the rainbow. The connections to be proved which these questions embody are identical generically, because all three are forms of repercussion, but specifically they are different. Other connections that require proof only differ in that the middle of one is subordinate to the middle of the other. For example, why does the Nile rise towards the end of the month? Because towards its close the month is more stormy. Why is the month more stormy towards its close? Because the moon is waning. Here the one cause is subordinate to the other. The question might be raised with regard to cause and effect whether when the effect is present the cause also is present, whether, for instance, if a plant sheds its leaves or the moon is eclipsed, there is present also the cause of the eclipse or of the fall of the leaves the possession of broad leaves, let us say, in the latter case, in the former the earth's interposition. For, one might argue, if this cause is not present, these phenomena will have some other cause. If it is present, its effect will be at once implied by it the eclipse by the earth's interposition, the fall off leaves by the possession of broad leaves, but if so, they will be logically coincident and each capable of proof through the other. Let me illustrate. Let A be deciduous character, B the possession of broad leaves, C vine. Now if A inheres in B, for every broad-leaved plant is deciduous, and B in C, every vine possessing broad leaves, Thena inheres in C, every vine is deciduous, and the middle term B is the cause. But we can also demonstrate that the vine has broad leaves because it is deciduous. Thus, let B broad-leaved, E deciduous, F vine. Then E inheres in F, since every vine is deciduous, and D in E, for every deciduous plant has broad leaves. Therefore every vine has broad leaves, and the cause is its deciduous character. If, however, they cannot each be the cause of the other, for cause is prior to effect, and the Earth's interposition is the cause of the Moon's eclipse and not the eclipse of the interposition, if, then, demonstration through the causes of the reasoned fact and demonstration not through the causes of the bare fact, one who knows it through the eclipse knows the fact of the Earth's interposition but not the reasoned fact. Moreover, that the eclipse is not the cause of the interposition, but the interposition of the eclipse, is obvious because the interposition is an element in the definition of eclipse, which shows that the eclipse is known through the interposition and not vice versa. On the other hand, can a single effect have more than one cause? One might argue as follows. Audiobook generated by, read with the ears.